just in, you know, kind of a quick review, you're going to do respiratory mechanics on your patient. You're going to do the minute ventilation for this, right? And from the information you get from that measurement, which is minute ventilation and respiratory rate, you're going to be able to do spontaneous tidal volume. And with those numbers, you can then do a rapid shallow breathing index. Then you're going to do a vital capacity times three. And then you're going to do an MIP times three. And you're going to record all those things and answer the questions on the back. That's not too complicated. It just takes practice. It takes a little bit of practice. So make sure that you get to know the manometers and the spirometer and make sure you get to remember how to instruct and how to coordinate the devices and things like that. That's, that's what's going to take the practice. All right. So now, uh, it says there after number 13, it says for this practicum, every patient is considered ready to be discontinued from ventilation, even though the parameters may not indicate so. So you may get a, you know, you may get a rapid shallow breathing index, you may get a small vital capacity, you may get a, a rapid shallow breathing index that's just you know, above 100, which is not good. You may get all bad numbers. But for this practicum, we don't care. You're gonna put this patient on a spontaneous breathing trial nevertheless, okay? <laughs> that's, that's all that that means. And you, you don't have to say, oh, they don't meet the criteria, we're not going. No, no you're going on. <laughs> okay, so. It's not that easy. Yeah, that's something I would've tried to do. 14 there, number 14, it says, record pre-SBT. Have you guys talked about spontaneous breathing trials with Mr. DeFleur yet? Not yet. Okay, well, it's a form of discontinuation. It's a trial. And essentially what it is, is you're allowing the patient to breathe with either no support, depending on your, you know, what your criteria is, or with minimal support, meaning like pressure support. Okay. For this practicum, and actually for the vast, majority of people who do spontaneous breathing trials uh, they're doing them on the ventilators it used to be that you just took the patient off the ventilator you put them on a T piece with a large volume nebulizer and you let them breathe through the through the T piece with the large volume nebulizer and you just you watched them you know see if they could breathe okay for the next 30 minutes Anyways, that's what a spontaneous breathing trial is. But now we, we have them on the ventilators. And it's better on the ventilators because uh, the ventilators are alarmed. Yeah. We know if the patient goes apneic, the alarms will go off and a backup ventilation will kick in. We also can uh, do pressure support ventilation, which means that we're going to help them breathe through that little small endotracheal tube. So it's much better to do it through the machines. They're monitored and alarmed, and they're, they can be supported. So it's much better to do them through the machines than rather through a T-piece and a large volume nebulizer. But it's called a spontaneous breathing trial. It is the most uh, efficient or the most effective way to determine if a patient's coming off, is ready to come off the ventilator. It is the most effective way. All the research says so. Mr. Clark will give you articles to read and he'll give you instructions to let you know that there's other methods, but this is by far the most successful way to determine if a patient's ready to come off the ventilator. All right, so it says changes the ventilator to spontaneous mode and begins a spontaneous breathing trial. I need to back up, I need to back up to 14. 14 says record pre SBT vitals. All right, so. Why do you think it's important to, re before I do the spontaneous breathing trial, to record my vital signs? Mm -hmm. To know, to watch their stats. If the patient the starts to, this, that. starts to have trouble breathing, they're not ready to breathe on their own, this is what will happen. They'll start breathing faster, they'll start breathing more shallow, okay? They're not gonna ventilate as well, their CO2 is gonna go up, their oxygen's gonna come down, their heart rate's going up, their blood pressure's going up, their anxiety levels are going up, and you have all the, and the blood pressure's gonna go up. You have all the baseline vitals already recorded. You know where they were, and so you know what they are now, and then you know, you know what, this is not working out good, and so we're gonna put them back on the ventilator and rest them. That's what you're gonna do. That's what you do when a patient fails a trial. <clears throat> and failure of a trial is when, <clears throat> You'll get Mr. DeClaire to give you all the numbers. 
but when their respiratory rate gets too high, their heart rate gets too high, their saturation gets too low, they'll fail and they meet these certain criteria. And then the solution to a failure is, is to put them back on the ventilator and let them rest for 24 hours. Because if you don't, if you take them off the ventilator again and let them have at it again, they're gonna fail again and they're gonna get weaker. So if you see somebody ordering multiple trials in a day, that's not right. Evidence base says that that is not good for patients. It wears them out. They fail, you rest them for 24, and then you try again to try to figure out why they failed, and then you go back at it again. So Mr. DeClure is gonna give you all that in the lecture, but what we're gonna do is actually proceed as if all the, you know, like the patient's ready. So we're gonna record spontaneous breathing trials and then we're gonna change the ventilator to a spontaneous mode. So what you're gonna to need to learn new on these ventilators is how do you get to the spontaneous mode? You have to learn that on these four ventilators. How do you get to the spontaneous mode? And then also it says, uh, correctly sets apnea backup ventilation. So guess what else you have to learn on these vents? Not apnea. only how to put them in a spontaneous mode, but you have to learn how to set the apnea and backup ventilation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Some of these vents, you can't even see that backup ventilation, that apnea backup ventilation, until you put them in a spontaneous mode. Then all of a sudden, those controls show up on the screen, and then you know, okay, I gotta set these backup parameters. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Backup means, here, I'll show you exactly what it means. Uh, this fan is very easy. On the uh, 840 here, you know, I'll just go to vent setup, and then I'm gonna come over here to mode, and I'm gonna just dial this down to spontaneous, okay? and I'm gonna go continue. And now it's going to do, it's gonna give me an option to make some adjustments. Well, uh, we're, we're not concerned about the tidal volume or the flow or this. That is strictly for, you're gonna see it's for manual ventilation. What I'm interested in now is pressure support. That's what I'm interested in. Remember, if the patient is breathing through an endotracheal tube, that's difficult. So we're always, if they're gonna breathe spontaneously, they're always gonna have a pressure support setting. If you have them in SIMV, okay, you have some spontaneous breathing that goes on between the mandatory breaths, what are you gonna put on those spontaneous breath. Pressure support, why? To overcome breathing through that tiny little tube, and it is tiny compared to the size of your trachea. So here's my pressure support control. Minimum, you're gonna set that to five. Nowadays, you see people set that 10 or 15, and then if the patient does well, they start to titrate it down a little bit, but minimum is five. So I'm gonna accept that five, and then my everything else is the same. The FiO2 is the same, blah, blah, blah. All right, so now I'm gonna press OK. So now I went from the sandbox on this, I went up, I'm live, I'm on pressure support. Okay, that's a spontaneous mode. Do you happen to see that patient breathing at all? No. I don't see that patient breathing at all. No. Okay, all right. So now it's pressure support, so it's completely patient driven. Would you be my patient for a little bit there? Good, thanks. Don't worry about these alarms. I'm just gonna move them out of the way for the time being. So I can go ahead. All right, so uh, I'm also now, I'm going to, I'm actually probably gonna do this beforehand, but I'm gonna, there's this, uh, it says, okay, let me set that alarm again. Okay, so I have the ability now to set up apnea parameters. Okay, so on the apnea parameters, when we say apnea setup, we're talking about rate, tidal volume, FiO2, PEEP settings. You want those to match what the patient was on during full support. Okay. Uh, so I think our full support <clears throat> was a rate of 14 and a tidal volume of 600, right? I think that's what it was, yeah. 600. Start breathing for me again. All you have to do is just touch it and it should give a breath. See that? You just touch it. 
Okay, so uh, let me get back on this here. So my spun my apnea setup, my apnea setup is full support ventilation as it was before I put them on pressure support. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So before I put this patient on pressure support, the full support settings were I think a rate of 14, total volume of 16, uh, flow of 55, and you know, FiO2. Uh, the FiO2 and apnea parameters either defaults to uh, what the patient was already on, okay, or it will go to 100%. For this practicum, we're going to set the FiO2 to 100% when it's possible. And the reason behind that logic is, is that if your patient fails a spontaneous breathing trial and pressure support, they probably need a little bit of boost of oxygen to just make it easier on their heart, make it easier on their muscles with breathing, their work breathing, et cetera, just to support them a little bit better. All right, so now I have my apnea parameters uh, set up. So the patient is now breathing spontaneously they're on a pressure support of five, okay? We're monitoring their vital signs. And if the patient stops breathing, okay, you can just do to stop breathing. If the patient stops breathing, then I know that in 20 seconds, because that's the apnea time I have set, that this machine is gonna kick in and give full support. It says apnea ventilation in progress. And now it's gonna start alerting me. It's gonna start alarming and letting me know, hey, your patient, we, your patient just went to the backup settings. Your patient did, is not breathing on their own. They went to the backup settings. So if the patient starts breathing on their own, it'll just turn off and go back to... It'll go right into the apnea setup, whatever you have it set up. No, I'm saying if the patient, like, the, now it's in the apnea setting, if oh. the patient starts breathing again. Yeah, I think it'll kick back in, go ahead. Not all of them will do that, but go ahead. Let me just turn off that a little bit. Let me yeah, so now we're back in pressure support. Yeah, so it's correct. Yeah. So we get that? Okay. All right. So when you put a patient in spontaneous uh, mode, we're always going to put in pressure support, and we're always going to have our apnea set up, okay. ready to roll. And then uh, if you're doing this in the clinic setting, okay, when you make this change, you're not going anywhere. You're gonna hang around. You're just gonna hang around the bedside for a little bit. You're gonna make the switch and you're just gonna stand. Stand there for a couple minutes and see how it's going. See how your patient's breathing, watch the vital signs. You know, and after a few minutes, you, you get the idea, you know what, they're still be doing okay. And now you wander out, but in the unit, it's not time to go have lunch don't want to have lunch now even though there's other people in there that's your patient you just kind of stay around the unit for a little while okay and, and if the, go ahead and if the apnea alarm comes on you just put them on whatever they were on before yeah you just go yeah. back off yeah the yeah if they fail if they fail and, and they don't uh, start breathing on their own again then we just uh, you just put the patient back on full support you change the mode you go back on whatever full support mode that you were on and then you just alert the doctor. Patient failed spontaneous breathing trial. Yeah, Jerry. Are these, uh, is this specifically a respiratory therapist job or does a nurse or doctor also sometimes do this? Uh, no, it's our job. We okay. usually get the door. They're not that some doctors couldn't do this. They could, because there's some doctors that <coughs> can operate these ventilators just fine. <coughs> That's a rarity. That's not the norm. Most doctors think they know how to operate, but they can't. But there are some doctors, there's some good pulmonologists that really know how to operate this equipment very well, but that's rare. It's usually 99.5% of the time is our job. Yeah, nurses don't really touch this equipment. If they do, you <laughs> pop out. Yeah. Pop out, touch it. <clears throat> it's your responsibility, not there. Okay, so we good with that? Yeah. All right, so let's read through this. Number 14, record pre, I'm gonna to go to full support here so we don't have to listen to this. 